Hi, my name is Danielle, Danny for short, and this is not exactly a good time. Smile, Danny. Don't make us feel bad. Yeah, I'm so happy to be sent away out of your sight. Don't get us wrong, darling. You're gonna love this school, right, honey? Yes, it's a prestigious school for children of affluent families. Your mother and I loved our time at Kingsbury as well. Because it was perfect for you. Trust me, I'm nothing like you. But one day you'll thank us for keeping you off the streets. It's always that condescending tone. As much as I hated being stuck at some age-old boarding school, I could use some time away from my parents. Before I go on, I should mention how this happened. Simple. I saw a big tough guy pushing around my friend, so I slashed his car tires in front of him to teach him a lesson. But to my parents, that was a rebellious act, so they're sending me to some boarding school as punishment. As we pulled up to Kingsbury's gates, I momentarily forgot how much I didn't want to be there. The medieval castle towers disappearing into the clouds could be mistaken for Hogwarts. I actually felt a string of hope for my future here. Unfortunately, those hopeful thoughts were short-lived. The principal, Mr. Hooper, had already read through my file and made up his mind about me. Rest assured, we have a reputation for our discipline for a reason, and students like Danielle here benefit the most from it. Clearly not the fresh start I had imagined. Mrs. Bell led me down the hall, then stopped at the door to room 237. A girl answered. Hi, Rumi. I'm Cassandra. You can call me Cass. Welcome to Kingsbury. Danny. You'll be under Cassandra's supervision outside school hours. She's a model student who has been here long enough to know that there is no way around our rules. Of course they'd make the teacher's pet babysit me. Awesome. Cass was worse than I thought. She constantly used looking for things as an excuse to touch my stuff. Surely she snooped around when I wasn't here too. So I figured I could have a little fun. I'd give this nosy roommate something to poke her nose into. This looks like an ordinary diary, but on the inside, I wrote about how I'd bring a vodka-filled water bottle to class, put bedbugs in Cass's bed, and sell cheat sheets to other students. You know, fun stuff. I definitely wouldn't do any of that, but gotta give our audience some drama, right? <laughs> and the next day, Cass's behavior confirmed she had really read it. Is everything okay, Cass? What? Everything's fine. Just thought it was time to wash the sheets. Don't mind me. Sure, girl. I believe you. At Kingsbury, there were rules for just about everything. I managed to break half of them within my first two weeks just by existing, it seemed. Worse still, the punishments hardly ever matched the crimes. I once had to reshelve hundreds of books for missing the 8pm curfew just because I was studying in the library. Another time, I had to clean the dining hall for an entire week because my shirt was untucked for a second. Not to mention, Mrs. Bell seemed to have eyes out for everything, everywhere, all at once. What in the world? How was I supposed to know Teen Vogue was considered contraband here? And that was punishable by cleaning every single candle holder in the school church. Could this school be any more constricting? Do they really expect us to entertain ourselves by laughing at the clouds like we're patients in an asylum? Or what? With literally zero fun, no wonder why everyone here always looks like zombies. I hear you're the new school rebel. Danielle, right? I'm Caroline. What do you say we blow this pop school stand and go have some real fun? No thanks, I've had enough trouble already. It's fine, come on. Hey, you, finish this up, won't you? The audacity of this chick, though. Um, how about no? You can't boss people around like that. Drop that self-righteous act already. No need to pretend you care about dorks. I'm good, and he's not the dork here. Ugh, I thought you were cool. What was that about? That boy thanked me, introduced himself as Ian, and asked what trivial fault I must have made to be stuck with this boring chore. So we chatted and made fun of Kingsbury's rules while I finished up. I felt like I was finally seen after those awful first weeks. Suddenly, things didn't feel so bad anymore. However, Caroline already set out to make my life miserable. This morning, she blocked me in the hallway right before the bell rang, which got me in trouble for being late and running. If she wasn't getting me in trouble, she was trying to humiliate me. And annoyingly, it worked. As much as I wanted to do something about it, I knew that any sort of retaliation would get me in more trouble. The only peaceful moments I had were with Ian. How come I never knew about these cool areas before? This is the entertainment room in the home theater system. And out there is our Olympic-sized swimming pool and the croquet field. Pretty cool, right? But we're almost never allowed to use them. Sometimes I think these are here just to impress parents. This place is unbelievable. All work and no play? Is this a prison? And still, I had a nosy roommate to deal with. To keep up the ruse, I wrote some more made-up shenanigans in my dummy diary. 
Ridiculous rules, Caroline's antics, and how passionately I hated Kingsbury made their way into the diary as well. We we're trapped on campus and anything fun was against the rules. It felt like we we're here to be reprogrammed into obedient robots our parents wish we were. But at least Ian's cool. The next day, Cass kept trying to strike up a conversation with me. Hey, Rumi. Everything good with you? Define everything. Like, how are you liking Kingsbury? Is anyone giving you trouble or anything? Should I be having problems? No, no, I hope not. I just thought you seemed a little down. As your Rumi, I wanted you to know that I'm here for you, if you need a friend. Oh, she must have read my diary again. But honestly, I found her clumsy cover-up quite endearing. Then she tried to change the subject to Caroline, who turned out to be her ex, Rumi. I know she's mean, but she wasn't always that way. She only changed after a big trouble that almost got her kicked out. Wow, what could she have possibly done? Cass said Caroline then soon moved to another room also. I can't help but feel bad for her, though. She was actually kind to me. Cass seemed genuinely nice, but I wanted to see if she could be honest. If you're really my friend, then tell me, did you read my diary? You know? But hear me out. Your parents paid me to keep an eye on you and report everything to them. I agreed because I thought I was helping you stay on track. But Cass said she soon realized I wasn't really doing those bad deeds, so she actually told my parents good things only. I promise I've stopped working for them. It was wrong of them to spy on you, but I was in the wrong too. I'm sorry, can you forgive me? I believed her, but it wouldn't hurt to use this newfound friendship for some good. So I asked Cass to propose a fun activity for the upcoming holiday season to lighten up this lifeless place. Teachers, listen to you, and we'll donate the money to a good cause. You love this place, don't you? Help make everyone else love it too. Sounds great. Let's do it. Thanks to Cass, our Christmas market came to life. I'd never seen so many smiling faces at Kingsbury. I even managed to secure some last-minute entertainment. Surprisingly, Ian volunteered to perform, and he's really good. He usually wasn't one to stand out, but that night, things changed. Maybe it was the Christmas lights or the Ed Sheeran effect was making Ian everyone's crush, including mine. Not only did we have a blast, but also raised thousands of dollars to donate to a local hospital. A few days after that, we saw Caroline being flirty towards Ian. Of course Caroline would try to sink her teeth into Ian now that she knew he's hot. Luckily, Ian didn't seem interested. What you looking at? Just you, making an absolute fool of yourself. How dare you? Thanks, Cass. She really wasn't taking the hint. That moment, I knew I'd found my people. The next day, while I was concentrating on my math exam, Caroline suddenly showed me something. I'm so sorry. Let's be friends. She wants to make up? Now? Mrs. Harris, she's copying me. What in the world? This shameless liar! I was preparing for the worst when Mrs. Harris said, What's this, Caroline? Her answers are nothing like yours. Not like Danielle needs to cheat off of you. She then gave me back my sheet and dismissed Caroline's. I could see she was still in shock when she walked out. Incredible! Mrs. Harris totally saw through her act. Mrs. Harris was unlike any other teacher at Kingsbury. She was firm, but kind. With her on my side, Caroline didn't bother me anymore. I felt safe confiding in an adult like her. We eventually became more like friends. You like Ian, don't you? I can tell just by looking. There's a carnival in town tomorrow night. That's your chance to make a move. But, Mrs. Harris, curfew... Okay, it didn't sound like a good idea, but I did want to go on a date with Ian, so I texted him and he immediately said yes. Mrs. Harris basically told me to go for it. What could go wrong? I tried to quietly leave, but as I stepped into the hallway, Mrs. Bell's flashlight blinded me and boy was she mad. So mad that she dragged me straight to Mr. Hooper's office. This was the second time I came here, which was a lot sooner than I expected. I knew from the start that you would be a problem, Miss Osborne. You have violated the rules time and time again and display a blatant disregard for authority. Sir, aside from tonight, I never intended to break any rule. I promise I've learned from those mistakes and won't be repeating them. They weren't minor offenses, Miss Osborne. Drinking, distributing cheat sheets, infesting your roommate's bed with bugs. Those were what I wrote in the dummy diary. How? We do not allow such delinquency here. In fact, you should be expelled at this very moment. However, out of respect for your parents, you may leave quietly by your own volition. I tried to explain myself, so he gave me three days to come up with evidence in the end. When I got back, I saw my desk drawer ajar, and Cass was asleep. She wouldn't do this. We're friends. But who else? My phone suddenly rang. It's Ian. 
I didn't want to talk about this over the phone, so I simply explained that someone didn't want me here and promised we'd talk later. I don't want you out either, bestie. Neither do I, Cassie. Not to waste any time, I came up with a plan to sniff out the culprit. This time, I wrote that I was playing a prank on Mrs. Bell. I even set up a silent alarm system with this piece of paper to see if anyone had opened my drawer. The next day, lo and behold, the alarm worked like a charm. They must have taken the bait. Now all there's left to do was... I opened the door to see someone totally unexpected. Now that my plan set in motion, Ian and I hid behind a wall near Mrs. Bell's office. This is an interesting first date. Romantic, isn't it? We suddenly heard footsteps approaching. I peeked around the corner to see... Mrs. Harris? I instantly felt my blood boiling. The one person who I trusted betrayed me. I was about to confront her when Ian pulled me back and put one hand over my mouth. Mrs. Harris looked around impatiently, then tried to open the door. As the hinges creaked open, Ian played a loud alarm. Startled, Mrs. Harris tripped and fell. Then Mrs. Bell sprinted towards us. <sighs> What's going on? I arrived just in time to catch these two sneaking around your office. They're playing a prank on you. Are you sure? Because that's not what the camera saw. She's lying. She wrote all about it in her diary. I'm here to catch her in the act. Mrs. Harris, how do you know what I write in my personal diary? I was just messing with my roommate. Are you trying to use them against me? Don't believe a word, she says. She's delinquent. Why would she write about sneaking in alcohol if she wasn't thinking of doing it? It's only a matter of time. So you just make up something if nothing happens, Mrs. Harris? Caroline appeared alongside Mr. Hooper. Mrs. Harris's face turned white at their sight. Caroline then said she accidentally overheard Mrs. Harris tell me to go out after curfew, which was shocking because she'd heard the same before. That's how Caroline was disciplined while her boyfriend was expelled. Recognizing the pattern in Mrs. Harris's behavior, she came to me. We decided to work together to stop this once and for all. Do you care to explain yourself? You really believe these rascals? They just want to make me look bad. That's not me in that video. It's deep fake. By that point, many students had gathered around us. They all came forward to share similar stories about Mrs. Harris. She gained their trust and persuaded them to break school rules. When they're on the verge of expulsion, she blackmailed their parents into paying her lots of money to keep them here. At this point, Mrs. Harris had to relent and admitted her wrongdoings. Mr. Hooper summoned me to his office the following day. Miss Osborne, I apologize for misjudging you. I am aghast to learn what Mrs. Harris was doing right under my nose. I may have never known it if it wasn't for yesterday's incident, so thank you. I assure you I'll do whatever it takes to fix the damages she caused. Sir, I don't think Mrs. Harris was the root of the problem. It's Kingsbury's harsh rules. I know you take great pride in them, but rigidity isn't helping. Obedient kids become soft and submissive, while strong-willed ones end up challenging authority. Mrs. Harris took advantage of that. Most students here are exceptional, but their creativity is getting crushed under iron discipline. Mr. Hooper patiently listened to me. In the end, he shook my hand and bid me farewell. A week later, we received an email titled, A Message from the Principal. It contained a video of Mr. Hooper giving a formal apology to the students and families who were victimized by Mrs. Harris, who won't be teaching at any school again. He also acknowledged the problems plaguing our school. Going forward, we will be installing council-based solutions to handle students' problems. Several harsh punishments will be abolished, and mental health services will be available to all. In addition, extracurricular activities will be encouraged. Things really changed for the better. Liveliness had returned to these beautiful hallways. Caroline stopped acting out and started patching things up with her old friend Cass. Now that the dust has settled, I think I'm in love with Kingsbury. And someone too. We're finally going on our long-awaited date. You might think it's impossible to be two people at once. Um, yeah. I'm Liana, but I'm also Kai. Confused? Then I suggest you check out part one of my story. In short, my mom fooled everyone, including me, into thinking I'm a boy when actually I'm a girl, so my traditional-minded family wouldn't be lured into giving away my inheritance. Back in the restaurant, and I'd just shown my mom how I wanted to go back to Philly and tell my family the truth. No. She shook her head. You can't. It's not the right time. But mom, why? I don't want to lie anymore. Stay here and I'll tell your father you're doing a master's degree. Again, with the lies, I'm sick of them. I just want to be me. I let out a frustrated sigh. I know you do, but I don't want you losing out on your future. I gave her a quizzing look. Come on, Mom, it wouldn't be that bad. Honey, Diamond is back, 
and she's adamant to worm her way into the company. Oh no. This changed things. You see, Diamond's my sassy, ambitious half-sister. My father had her with his mistress. Now Diamond was back from her studies in Australia, and eager to claim what she believed was hers. Ugh. Mom continued. She's always snooping around the house, and her attitude is awful. It's only a matter of time before she refuses to leave. That's why I told you this was not an appropriate time to come out with the truth. Diamond would take advantage of it and turn everything into a bigger mess. Well, that was that. I had no choice but to stay in Canada. Ugh. On the plus side, at least I could be Liana here. Then one night, I just returned home from a party in my bodycon dress and heavy makeup when my phone buzzed. It was a video call from Mom. Hi, Mom. I popped myself down on my bed. Ugh! Oh, that diamond is a piece of work! She used my Ralph Lauren trinket dish as an ashtray! Can you believe that? Oh, that's awful. Have you spoken to Dad about it? Right at that moment, I saw my father appear behind Mom, and he asked her if she was talking to Kai. Startled, I immediately took off my wig, wiped my lips onto the back of my hand, pulled off my eyelashes, and wrapped a blanket around me so he couldn't see my dress. I reappeared on screen with a forced smile and lowered my voice to say, Hi, Dad, he coldly asked. Why is your face so dirty? I, I ju just on, oh, n nothing. Your mother and I are to attend an important corporate event this weekend, and I want you to come with us. It will be a good experience for you. Be home by Saturday. When my father demands something, well, then there's absolutely zero point in questioning him about it, so it looks like Kai was going back to Philadelphia. That weekend, I packed my bags and transformed myself back into Kai. Jeez, I'd forgotten how much it sucked having to wear these unflattering clothes. Mom was there to pick me up at the airport. She rushed over to me and gushed. Look at you. My daughter is so handsome. I have to admit that I was really nervous on the way home. By the time the grand house came into view, I felt like I was going to barf. I hadn't been Kai properly in years. What if I messed up and then Dad disowned both me and Mom? Mom must have sensed how I was feeling as she took my hand and led me inside. My father was sitting on the edge of the couch with a black coffee and a ton of paperwork in front of him. Hi, Dad. <clears throat> Mom elbowed me, so I coughed to clear my throat, then in a male voice said, Hi, Dad. Your son is back. Yes. Hello. Dad replied, his attention still on his paperwork. Phew. It seemed that he hadn't noticed my voice mishap. After that, I went up to my room, freshened up and changed into my suit. I sprayed myself with cologne, as smelling like a guy might make me act more like one, right? Later on, my father drove us to the event. He wouldn't stop going on about people he wanted to impress and contracts he was after. So without thinking, I grabbed my mom's purse and pulled out her compact mirror and lipstick. I pouted my lips and was about to put it on when I saw my dad glaring at me in the rearview mirror. Um, it's just lip balm. The flight really dried them out. I licked my lips as I quickly dropped the items back into Mom's purse. Mom peered back at me with a be careful look. The event was hard work. Having to be Kai in front of all these big wigs took it out of me. So by the time we arrived home, I was ready to sleep for a week. Daddy, I'm so glad you're back. How was your event? A girl suddenly rushed out of nowhere and wrapped her arms around my father. Oh, hi, Mrs. Wilson. And you must be my half-brother, Kai. Hi, she smirked. This was Diamond, my unruly half-sister. Mom and I both muttered back hellos, but Dad seemed oblivious to the tension between us all. It was rather successful. I believe the Woodward contract will be mine very shortly. Well, seeing as you're here, you must stay for dinner. After dinner, Mom and I went to the kitchen to bring out the desserts, leaving Dad and Diamond alone. But as we headed back to the dining room, we heard Diamond say, Please let me be your assistant. I want to learn more about the family company. Besides, I'm far more business-minded than Kai, so I don't see why I can't be the director one day. Hearing this, Mom cleared her voice. Diamond then startled and turned around to see Mom holding up a plate with a smile. Anyone for fruit? The next day, Mom asked me to go on a walk with her around the garden. Through gritted teeth, she said, you heard what that devil Diamond said to your father. She's after your position in the company. 
We can't let her get away with this. Oh no, what did my mother have planned now? I didn't want to play games, I just wanted to be Liana. She continued, You'll have to come back home at once and work in the company. As Kai, of course. No way, I yelled. I followed your selfish rules for twenty years. This is my time now. I'm not doing this. I started to walk away, but Mom pulled on my arm. Darling, I know. She let out a thoughtful sigh. But if you tell the truth now, then your father might disown us, which will allow Diamond to wriggle her way to what is rightfully yours. We can't let this happen. It's unacceptable. I shook free of Mom's grip and stormed off. This time she didn't try to stop me. I needed time to think this all through. I didn't want to be Kai anymore, but I also didn't want us to lose everything. I really hate doing this, but I guess it's not totally unreasonable of Mom having to pull out these desperate measures. I found my mother in the conservatory, staring thoughtfully out of the window. On seeing me, she smiled. Oh, Kai, I... Mom, I'm sorry. I've been childish. I know you only want the best for me. Mom took my hand and replied, No. I'm the one who's been asking too much of you. I've been thinking and perhaps there's a way in which you can be both Kai and Liana. I gave her a questioning look, and she continued, it's bonkers, of course, but it might just work. She chuckled. Kai should get engaged to Liana. What? My mother wanted me to get engaged to myself? But then thinking about it, my mother was an expert at bringing her crazy ideas into fruition. Besides, what did I have to lose? Well, besides my entire family and inheritance. So the next day, while I was having dinner with my parents and grandparents, I stood up and announced, I have something to tell you all. I have a fiancé, Liana. She's smart, beautiful, well-educated, and you're all going to love her. We plan to marry as soon as I finish my master's degree. And I passed around my phone with a Liana picture on it. My grandparents seemed thrilled, and my grandpa said, Ah, oh, yes, it's about time our beloved grandson found himself a wife. I held my breath as the picture reached my father and he peered down at it with scrutinizing eyes. He looked up at me, and for a horrible moment I thought he'd figured out the truth. But then he said, Good, good. So, when will we meet this Liana? Soon. Uh, she's just finishing her courses. She's coming over next week. Um, but I still had some paperwork going on at school, so Liana will visit you guys first, and I'll fly home later. That's how excited she is to meet you all. Oh, I can't wait, dear. She seems like a lovely young lady. My grandma looked genuinely happy. Then I continued, Yes, Nanny, she, she is. And in fact, I turned to Dad. Anna is looking for an internship. It would be nice if she could get a spot in our company, as she'll have to learn about our family's business sooner or later. Right, Dad? He seemed pleased as he replied, Very well. Just bring her over. So Mom's latest crazy plan seemed to be working. After my announcement, I stayed home for a few more days as Kai, and I flew back to Canada, packed my things, and flew back as Liana. Phew! This was exhausting. Walking into the house with all eyes on me was terrifying, but everyone rushed over and greeted me. Even Diamond. Mom linked arms with me. Darling, our house has plenty of guest rooms. You gotta stay here. I insist. We all are family now, aren't we? Please, make yourself at home. Smiling, I replied. Thank you, Mrs. Wilson, that would be lovely. Suddenly Diamond interrupted. Oh, seeing as this house has that many spare rooms, why can't I have one? Mom looked flustered, then reluctantly replied. Um, sure, Diamond. I have never said that you couldn't. Just pick one. This was not part of the plan, but fine. I ain't scared of her. Mom then led me to my room and kept reminding me to be extra careful now that Diamond was around 24-7. On one occasion, I was reading by the window in our home library when Diamond waltzed in and yanked the book off me. Oh, I get it. You're only marrying that half-brother of mine for the first edition books, she winked. I took the book back off her then politely replied, Yes, I'll marry whoever I need to if it means getting this eighth edition book published in 2017. Oh, the glamour. Hilarious. She just sneered and walked away to hide the humiliation. 
Unfortunately, even at work, I didn't get a break from Diamond. Instead, I was assigned a job under her management. Ugh. One time, I returned from lunch to find the report I was working on had vanished from my desk. I pulled my desk apart looking for it, only for her to pass it to me at the end of the day. Then, with this devious grin on her face, she said, You were meant to have this finished today, weren't you? It looks like you're in for a late one. Ugh! She was definitely more of an imitation than a diamond. And as he'd predicted, my father ended up getting the Woodward contract, and it was a huge deal. Some of the representatives from the company were coming in to discuss the project, so everyone seemed to be buzzing around like flies in preparation. Diamond ordered me to make coffee and take it to our guests. I was walking with the tray of drinks when I bumped straight into someone. Oh no, the coffee soaked his white shirt. As I muttered out a sorry, I realized something. I knew this man. He looked really familiar. It was Kevin, my old school friend. He'd changed so much, but it was definitely him. I'd recognize him anywhere. But he didn't seem to recognize me, which I guess wasn't surprising seeing as I was dressed as a girl. Hmm. I wonder what he was doing here. Yes! Headshot! Go cry to your mama! <laughs> You're probably wondering who this gaming pro is. Well, that's me. Yes, it's 3 a.m., and I've been playing for nine hours straight, but time sure does fly when I'm gaming. I'm Cooper, by the way, and I live with my wife Amelia and our baby girl Ara. I wanted to call her Zelda, but my wife said no way. I love gaming, and always thought it would be there to save me, but instead, it almost cost me everything I love. It started back when I was a little kid. My parents argued a lot, so I used to make a fort in my room, switch on my Nintendo DS, and escape into a virtual world. This love of games continued as I grew up. I didn't socialize or anything. Instead, I rushed home from school and went straight on my Xbox, PlayStation, or PC. I didn't have any real friends. Nope. The only kids I spoke to were ones I gamed with. Then I graduated from college and ended up with a job as a system engineer for a big tech company. Jeez, it was exhausting. By the time I got home, I was so tired I could barely keep my eyes open, let alone game. So, I put my gaming equipment in the basement. But then everything changed when I bumped into Amelia in a local coffee house. Whoa. She was the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I guess she must have seen something she liked in this goofball, as after dating six months, we got married. I know. Crazy, huh? Soon after, she fell pregnant. I was excited but also terrified. How did that happen? I mean, I know how it actually happened, but whoa. Me? A dad? Then, when Aura was born, my life turned completely upside down. You see, babies cause a lot of stress. Did you know that the quickest way to get a child's attention is to sit down and look comfortable? Because every time I did that, she started to cry. Work sucked, and then my home life sucked too. There was no escape. I felt like I was going to explode. So, I went down to the basement and set my PC up. I started playing World of Warcraft. It felt incredible to be a druid again. The thought of gaming kept me going at work. Then when I got home, I barely acknowledged my wife and daughter and rushed down to the basement to play games. Amelia wasn't happy about it. She often appeared with a crying aura and told me to take her. But I just grunted out a, I'm busy, then carried on with my game. Hey, she was the one at home all day while I worked my butt off. All she needed to do was take care of the baby and keep the house clean. Easy. I told her this, and she got mad and made me sleep on the couch. Great. No, I mean really great! I could play video games all night long. <laughs> awesome. But it turns out it's much easier to game all night when you're in high school and can catch some Z's at the back of the class. But not so easy when you have a taxing job. I was on level 100 of exhaustion. So it wasn't surprising that I ended up messing up at work and got fired. Amelia was furious and demanded I apply for other jobs. Nah, I didn't want to. I mean, hello? No more early mornings, no more deadlines, no more cranky boss. It was just me and my beloved games. On one occasion, I was heading toward a record high score when suddenly Amelia appeared and blocked the screen. Babe, you need to move. I jabbed at the game console as I desperately tried to peer around her. No, she shouted at me. What's happened to you, Cooper? You look like Gandalf, only the homeless version. You hadn't taken a bath and shaved for weeks. You're killing me here. Now I'm dead. Thanks a lot. 
I slammed my fist onto the table. That's it! Get out! She yanked on my arm. I can't take this anymore! Get out! She actually kicked me out of my own home. That crazy woman! I didn't have any friends, so I ended up at my parents' house. This was so humiliating. I told them that it was just Amelia being hormonal, but they said she told them all about my gaming obsession, and it had to stop. They'd signed me up to be some guinea pig for an experimental treatment program in Hawaii. Hey, maybe a beach vacation didn't sound so bad, right? But nope. The island was literally in the middle of nowhere. Where was the hotel? All I saw were tiny huts with grass roofs. What? They couldn't expect me to stay here. This instructor guy called Cole gathered the group on the beach and gave us a rundown of the rules. We'd be camping here for the whole month without any digital devices. We also had to follow a strict diet and exercise plan. Are you kidding me? I felt like I'd been sucked into a survival game and the escape button was busted. Everybody else started building their tents side by side. Socializing wasn't really my thing, so I built my tent away from them by the sea. It was hungry work and my stomach was rumbling. So I asked Cole when dinner was ready. He told me it was my job to make a fire. Then he passed me a note with instructions. One, gather dry wood. Two, create a fire structure. Three, light the fire by using the hand drill method. Okay, sounded easy. Dang it, I've been spinning this for about 20 minutes now. Where's the damn fire? I was about to give up when I suddenly saw something glowing. Oh my God, it worked. But then I felt the sneeze and couldn't hold it. Oh no, there goes the ember. In the end, this one guy pushed me out of the way and lit the fire in a few minutes. What a show off. I was licking my lips in excitement when I saw Cole bringing out some food. But disappointedly, he passed me a plate of veg. What? I shouted out, where's the freaking chicken? Cole pointed at the white thing on my plate. It's chicken breast. No, that's not chicken. Where are the wings and the breadcrumbs? He rolled his eyes. It's called clean eating. Get used to it. This place was a nightmare. But a good night's sleep would make me feel better, right? Wrong, as the ground was as hard as rocks. Finally, I fell asleep, only to wake up with soggy feet. Oh no, my tent was flooded. No wonder nobody else chose to camp next to the ocean. Island routine was awful. It was full of dumb group activities such as meditation, beach soccer, and hiking. One day, we even had to build a raft. As usual, I tried my best to avoid working and socializing, but there's no way they'd leave me alone so I reluctantly participated. After it was done, we tried it out, but it soon capsized, and I was the only one that couldn't swim. Everyone immediately rushed over and saved me. I was so touched and felt ashamed that I've been so self-centered. So after that, I actually tried to put myself out there and be more sociable. And not gonna lie, it was not too bad. Then our evenings were spent sitting around the campfire and listening to everyone drone on about their problems. My turn was easy for me because I had no problems. The problem was my wife, not me. She didn't understand that I had a lot of pressure at work and home. So playing video games was my only escape. Everyone tutted and glared at me. Then a guy named Brad said, That's not cool, bro. To be honest, I was the same way. I was addicted to watching sports and refused to help my wife out. So we switched places and I learned how hard caring for the kids and looking after the house is. I knew I needed to change before I lost my family forever. So that's why I joined the program. Poor guy, but this wasn't the same for me, was it? I don't know, maybe I had been a little unfair on Amelia. I was thinking about this as I walked back to my tent when this girl named Brittany caught up with me. She put her hand on my shoulder and flicked out her hair. Was she, um, flirting? I waved my wedding ring finger in front of her, but she just shrugged and said, I don't see your wife here. Come to me when you change your mind. Then she walked away. Jeez, this girl was crazy. Kinda hot but still crazy. The next day, I unzipped my tent, ready for another day in this nightmare. But what was this? Huh? It was kind of beautiful here. It was like I was seeing it for the first time. The sparkling sand, swaying palm trees, lush tropical plants, and endless sunshine. Amelia and Aura would love it here too. I hoped they'd both forgive me. I really did miss them. By the end of the month, I didn't want to go home and play games anymore. Instead, I wanted to hug my family and never let them go. The day before we left, Cole rewarded us all with a one-minute phone call. As much as I wanted to hear Amelia's voice, I was kind of nervous. I hope she wasn't mad at me anymore. The phone started to ring, but some guy picked up. I asked where Amelia was, but he said she was in the shower. Then the line went dead. My one minute was up. Who was that dude? 
Was she having an affair? We were still married. And we have a child together. Furious, I ran into Brittany's tent, wanting to get back at my cheating wife. Brittany came toward me and was about to kiss me, but I couldn't go through with it. So I dodged out of the way, mumbled out a, uh, sorry, then hurried out of there. The next day, I finally got off the island, and I went straight home to confront Amelia. I opened the door to see a man standing there holding my little Ara. How dare he? I yelled out, get away from my daughter. Suddenly, Amelia appeared. Cooper, stop, it's Rob. I processed this information. Oh, wait, he was Rob, her half-brother. Oops. I'd never met him before as he'd been living abroad. I quickly muttered out an apology to him. <laughs> How embarrassing. I noticed Amelia was giving me this weird look. Then she said, Wow, Cooper, you look so different. Oh yeah, before we were sent home, each of us were treated to a little makeover. A new haircut, new clothes, and a shave. And the clean eating and exercise meant I'd lost 20 pounds. Guess Amelia just couldn't resist this new hottie in town. She went straight for one big hug. So, in the end... Amelia forgave me for being a massive jerk. Now I have a new job. It's pretty boring, but I enjoy coming home and spending time with my family. As for gaming, I still do it, but in moderation. Only Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I make sure I switch it off by 10 p.m. Then I go and cuddle my wife. The gaming world is great and all, but I've come to learn that there's something even better in life. And that's making memories in the real world with my girls. Oops, still not it. Wow. Why do they have an entire room just for shoes? That's mental. I muttered to myself as I closed the door. I swear, that was like the 20th door I'd opened. This place was insane. I had no idea which door would lead to my bedroom. To be honest, I've never been anywhere this lavish before in my entire life. Okay, it's now down to this door or that one over there. Wish me luck. But as I reached for the doorknob, I heard a voice. Hey, what prank you trying to pull on me again? I caught you red-handed this time, Gabby. Startled, I turned around, and... Oh, wow. There was this super cute guy standing there, looking so smug with himself. So, this must be Jaden, the annoying big brother that Gabby had told me about. Only, he didn't seem annoying to me. But, right. I needed to stay in character, so I replied, Um, yeah, guess I was just too busy thinking about stuff that I didn't watch where I was going. Take it easy, bro. Then I immediately fled to the other room while Jaden watched me in confusion. Phew, that was a close one. And, wow, was Gabby a princess or something? She lived in a literal palace. Look at her room. Oh, you must be wondering. Yes, I'm not Gabby. I'm Nancy. So how come Jaden didn't realize that I was not his sister? Now, let me tell you. That's one wild story. I was just a normal teenager, living my peaceful life in the Missouri countryside. My family doesn't have a lot of money, so I worked part-time in a nearby diner, so I could save up for college. Yeah, it wasn't perfect, but I knew I was lucky to have my loving family. They're my everything. So, anyway, it wasn't uncommon for schools from St. Louis to arrange trips out here, to show the kids what country life was like. And on days like those, the diner could get pretty hectic, and today was no exception. By the time my shift finished, I was a tired, sweaty mess, so I took the scenic route home to unwind. That's when I heard this girl screaming for help. She must have slipped and fell into this ditch. I quickly found a big branch to help pull her out of there. Then she brushed the dirt off her as she said, Thanks. But as she looked up at me, OMG. We both jumped up in such a fright that we almost stumbled back into the ditch. She looked exactly like me. I pinched myself to check I wasn't hallucinating or something. I mean, I was super exhausted from work. We stared at each other gormlessly for a bit. Then she suddenly reached out her hand and slapped me. Ouch! I raised my eyebrows at her, and she just grinned back. Oops, sorry. Just checking this isn't a dream. That's when I saw it. Her bracelet. The pendant on it was a strange shape. A strange shape like mine. 
I held out my wrist to slot my bracelet's pendant into hers, and it formed a butterfly. What's more, carved on the back of it was our birthday, November 3rd. Oh my god, no wonder why. I always asked my parents why they bought me such an ugly bracelet. Turns out it was two halves of a hole? She shrieked. So, do you think we're... twins? I was still in shock, but I managed to mutter out, Must be. She excitedly clapped her hands together, then pulled me into a hug. She said her name was Gabby, and her field trip was so dull that she wandered off, then ended up lost and stuck. Then I told her about my loving family, and she told me about her city life. I thought her life sounded awesome, but she didn't think so. Nah, it's seriously so boring over there. I just want a happy, drama-free life like yours. It makes sense now. I see why my parents love my brother more than me. I'm obviously adopted. But hey, at least you have your friends and get to go to a good school. School? That's the worst part. I hate it. Then she paused and turned to me. Nancy, I have an amazing idea. How about we switch places? This was crazy. An hour ago, I thought I was an only child, and now I was staring at my twin. Gabby seemed adamant switching places was the best idea ever, as I'd get a taste of the city life while also helping her ace her upcoming exams. This did sound tempting. I mean, it wasn't every day your long-lost twin appeared and offered you the adventure of a lifetime, right? We didn't have much time to discuss it anymore, so we quickly switched clothes, phones, and further instructions about anything else would be discussed later over the phone. Then, I showed her the way to my house, and I headed toward the crowd of noisy students lining up for the bus back to the city. Suddenly, a girl tapped me on the shoulder and in an annoyed tone said, Er, uh, where have you been? Blonde hair, a pink hairband, and wearing a choker with a heart pendant on it? Yep, this must be Katie, Gabby's best friend. I followed her onto the bus, then yawned and told her I was exhausted. I feigned sleeping for the duration of the journey back so she wouldn't start any more convos with me. So after that, things went by smoothly. Until I got home and didn't know where I normally sleep at. But it's okay now, as I'm safe in Gabby's bedroom. The butler did knock on the door to ask me to come down for dinner. I know, the fact they have a butler is crazy but I just lied that I'd eaten loads on the field trip. There was no time for food now. I needed to learn as much as I could about these people. I searched her room and looked through her yearbooks, family photos, anything. I thought I was ready to go to school as Gabby tomorrow, but, well, as if it was that simple. The next morning, I nervously came downstairs to go to school, and of course, I had to face the entire family now. Upon seeing me, the small talks all came flying at me. How was yesterday's trip, dear? I managed to mumble out, Um, it, it was all right. Then suddenly, a hand rubbed my hair. Hey, I'm taking your PB&J, okay? You won't eat it anyway. I turned to look and saw him grinning at me before he headed outside. Oh gosh, I thought I'd melted into a puddle. He's so cute. I just wanted to follow him but then Dad cleared his throat. Gabriella, can we please make it a day free of complaints from your teachers? Oh God, Gabby, what had you possibly done? I gulped back, nodded in response, then hurried out of there. I awkwardly lingered in front of the mansion. This was the spot where the bus dropped me off yesterday, so hope this was how it worked. Then suddenly, a scary-looking guy pulled up on the other side of the street and yelled at me. Babe, what are you doing? Get in. Me? I was his babe? Oh, so he was Dylan, my sister's boyfriend. I walked over and reluctantly climbed on the back seat. Hey, what's wrong? Are you still mad at me for letting you go on the field trip alone? Come on, you said it was okay. I didn't know what to say to him, so I stayed quiet and stared out the window. Come on, babe. I mean, this is dumb. We both know how sitting in the back always gives you travel sickness. Gosh, I really needed to say something to shut this guy up, huh? 
No, it's totally fine between us. Um, it's just that I feel a bit under the weather. I need a little rest, that's all. And it's more spacey here. Well, that seemed to quiet him down, but I kept on catching him giving me odd looks in the rearview mirror. Look at him! Ugh! Gabby and I might be twins, but our tasting guys couldn't be any more different. Dylan looked like the bad boy type. Green hair, a nose ring, and drove some flashy sports car. While I prefer sweet and funny guys, like Jaden. But I didn't want to accidentally ruin my sister's relationship either. So when we got to school, I had to give him a peck on the cheek to make sure that we were cool. Yuck. His cologne stank. Luckily, I met Katie in the parking lot, so I followed her to class. Things were going great. At least, they were, until we got to Spanish class. The teacher, Mrs. Harrison, gave me this judgy look right from the moment I walked in. Turns out, Gabby hadn't handed in her homework, and she spent the whole of the last session painting her nails. Mrs. Harrison demanded to check my homework today. Well, of course, I didn't know I had homework. So, in a disappointed voice, she said, Gabby, it's been two years and you still don't know how to conjugate any single verb. Are you proud of that? Suddenly, I heard Katie whisper, But at least she knows how to dress, Mrs. Harrison. Your sweater looks like it should have been thrown out two years ago. Then some of the class giggled. Oh my god, Katie? That was so rude. But luckily, the teacher didn't hear that. I quickly apologized to Mrs. Harrison and told her to just give me a pop quiz to make up for my missing homework. She did. And to her, and the whole class's total surprise, I slayed all the questions. After class, I told Katie that her comment about Mrs. Harrison wasn't cool. Laughing, she replied, Jeez, why are you so uptight today? But on seeing my unfaltering expression, she quickly changed the subject. You've still got to help me with the plan, okay? You promised. She winked at me. What? What plan? In confusion, I faked a smile at Katie. Oh, don't you worry, girl. I got it all set. That night, Gabby called me and we updated each other on our first day. Things went better than expected. Apparently, she loved it there. And she felt so warm and connected with mom and dad. And she was sure that they were our real parents. She also enjoyed feeding the chickens and apple picking in the backyard. However, she did almost get me fired from work as she didn't know how to use the oven, but she managed to charm her way out of it. I told her how I'd handled the Dylan situation and made peace with Mrs. Harrison. But, oh, Gabby, Katie did mention to me about some plan? What is it? Oh, yeah, I promised to set her up with Jaden. I guess you'll have to carry it out for me now. My heart sank as I said, Jaden? As in, your brother Jaden? Yeah, now not biologically. It's no wonder I just couldn't get along with him. Not like us, right? I forced a laugh and changed the subject. But, oh no. Jaden was far more suited to me than rebellious Katie. But, okay, this was Gabby's life, so I needed to make sure I didn't mess it up. And maybe, when this twinning truth broke out, I'd get my chance with Jaden. For now, we agreed to continue living each other's lives. I suppose it was pretty easy seeing as all Gabby seemed to do was hang out with her friends and avoid doing her homework. The only part I didn't like was setting Katie up with Jaden. And that's when things got complicated. Will we ever tell everyone the truth? Or this life swap is too much fun to stop? Stay tuned for part two to find out. So, the data needs to be collected by Friday so we can... I lowered my head and stuffed a pretzel into my mouth. Danny, are you eating? My boss glared back at me. I wiped my mouth onto the back of my hand and with cheeks full of food muffled out. No, no, of course not. It turns out my eagerness to eat a delicious, salty, crunchy pretzel during a work meeting, I'd forgotten to turn my microphone off. Oops. Hey, so I'm Danny and I'm in love with food. Why, you ask? Well, food's the one thing that's always been there for me. Through the good times and the bad, it's never let me down. 
All it takes is a hamburger with extra cheese and a salted caramel cheesecake, and I'm a happy girl. Gee, I'm salivating just thinking about it. But then my love of food almost cost me everything. Here's how. So after the pretzel incident, my boss fired me. Harsh. I know. This left me with no job, and as a result, no money to buy tasty snacks. What a bummer. One night, I was lounging on the couch, watching a movie and daydreaming about eating a triple chocolate sundae, when Jake, my boyfriend, sat down next to me with a huge bowl of candy and started telling me about his work colleague's birthday party. Ooh, candy. I grabbed a handful and started shoveling it into my mouth. Thanks, Jake. He knew the way to my heart. In between munching, I asked him, Can you bring a plus one? I want to go with you. Please? He shrugged and said, Sure. I clapped my sticky hands together. Ooh, a party! This was so exciting, as parties meant there'd be food and lots of it. As soon as we arrived there, I made a beeline for the buffet table. OMG! This was amazing. There were club sandwiches, mini pizzas, and potato salad bowls. I lifted the entire serving bowl up and started spooning the food into my mouth. Then some woman appeared next to me, frowning. She said, Um, excuse me? Please, can you not eat out of the serving bowl? With my mouth full, I replied, Oh, sorry, it, it tastes so good. Then I placed the bowl back down and grabbed a handful of potato chips. As she walked away, I heard her mutter under her breath, What a greedy guts. Eventually, Jake grabbed my arm and led me out of there. He was sulking and could barely meet my eye, so I asked him what was up. What's up? He grunted. Do you even need to ask? You sit around all day eating everything out of the cupboards. Then when I bring you along to my colleague's party, you hog the buffet? It was so embarrassing. This bummed me out. Um, I guess maybe I could have a little more self-control around party food. And I guess I did need to find a job. Besides, having money meant I could buy better snacks. And I wouldn't have to keep on taking Jake's. So I got a part-time job at my local cinema on the popcorn counter. Mmm, that sweet, buttery popcorn smell. How I adored it. I couldn't help it. It was there staring at me in all of its warm, golden stickiness. So in between serving a customer, I sneakily stuffed some into my mouth. What are you doing? My heart stopped as I heard a familiar voice behind me. I turned around and came face to face with my manager. I denied immediately. I, I wasn't doing anything. As popcorn popping out of my mouth. They shouted at me and accused me of eating all the profits. So unfair. So you guessed it, I was fired. Again. I arrived home early with a tear-stained face and a bag full of my favorite chocolate treats to cheer me up. Jake looked over at me from the couch and asked me what was up. I slumped down next to him, pulled the wrapper off a chalk bar, and said, I got fired again. I couldn't help it. it it's popcorn. It's too tasty. Does this world need to be so cruel? Then I took a bite out of the chocolate. Mmm, delicious. Jake shook his head, then sighing, said, Danny, admit it. It's your gluttony that gets you into trouble. So what? I enjoy eating, that's all. It doesn't hurt anyone. I finished the chalk bar and started unwrapping the next one. Jake shook his head, then walked off. Whatever. I didn't need his support as I had delicious chocolate to comfort me. Yum. One day, like every other day, I searched the house for snacks, but nope, there weren't any anymore. I didn't have any money, so I couldn't go to the shop. So instead, I went on my phone and searched mukbang videos to kill some time. As I watched two girls stuff their mouths full of french fries dipped in a strawberry shake, I had an idea. Of course. Why hadn't I thought of this earlier? I should become a mukbanger. I'd get to earn money while doing what I love, eating food. It was a win-win. For my first video, I kept it simple. It was just me in a white t-shirt, my phone as a camera, and a huge bowl of spaghetti. Crazily, people watched it and began following me. After a couple of videos, my popularity increased and my viewers started donating food and money to me. It was totally nuts. But with these things came the video requests, such as, eat three tubs of fried chicken, and ten plates of fried rice covered in mayo. 
Eating all this food did get kind of challenging. Once I was halfway through a hamburger eating video when I got a stitch in my stomach and had to stop. I so shouldn't have eaten pancakes for breakfast earlier. My fans were bummed out that I stopped the challenge and I felt really bad. I figured that if I was going to make this my job, then I'd have to start fasting beforehand so I could be at my best for the videos. Gee, this was hard work. One time I was so hungry, I went into the fridge and sniffed the cheese. But then when I finished a challenge, I felt so full and bloated that I resembled a puffer fish. Then there was the tiredness. I was so exhausted. I fell asleep on the bus to the supermarket and ended up in some weird town miles away. I had to ring Jacob to come and pick me up and he grumbled about it for the whole way back. Regardless of this, I carried on with the videos. But then one day a fan challenged me to the biggie, the fire noodle challenge. If you don't know what this is, then basically it involves a massive bowl full of the spiciest noodles ever. I took a mouthful of the noodles and OMG, I couldn't feel my tongue or face. My nose was running and I had to stick my tongue out to check if it was still there. This was just too much. There's no way I could endure any more of this. So I switched the bowl for non-spicy noodles and pretended I was eating the hot ones. Afterward, I edited the video and hey, I think I did a great job of faking it. Even though I'd only had one mouthful of the spicy stuff, it was repeating on me. My stomach gurgled and my tongue still felt numb. I lay on the couch with the hot water bottle pressed to my stomach and feeling sorry for myself. Jake sat down next to me and gave me a concerned look. Danny, you gotta stop this video thing and get a real job. With my swollen tongue, I managed to sputter out, Eating on videos is a real job. Jake shook his head. Gluttony is not a hobby. Everyone's just laughing at you. Um, hello. I was being paid for eating, and these videos help many lonely people out there to have company during a meal. They were laughing with me, not at me. Jeez, Jake was so boring at times. Between the spicy noodle challenge and some weird bug eating challenge in which I used jelly worms covered in chocolate instead of the real deal, faking became the norm for me. Soon the articles started circulating saying I was a fake eater. Posts such as, she's faking all the time? And no wonder she's still in shape, popped up everywhere. After that I had no choice but to live stream eat. Lots of my fans encouraged this, but it was hard work. It didn't take long for the weight to pile on, and within a month, I was up two dress sizes, and I felt super sluggish. One morning when Jake saw me searching my wardrobe for something, anything to wear that would fit me, he suggested we go jogging. I stared down at my favorite jeans that I now couldn't get past my thighs, and agreed to go. I had made it to the end of the block, and whoa, it was hot, and ugh, I couldn't breathe. I was crouched over, clutching a fence for support when a pregnant woman walked by. You're such an inspiration. Running at your age and after giving birth, even without this one, she clutched her bump. I wouldn't be able to manage it. What? Did she think I just had a baby and I was old? Oh, great. And now Jake burst out laughing too. I felt terrible. Did I really look that bad? This lingered in my mind, so I ended up going online and ordering some weight loss pills. I started taking them, and within a week, I had breakouts, stinky breath, awful wind, and I felt like a slug. Then one time I was in the kitchen taking the pills when Jake walked in, saw what I was doing, snatched them out of my hand, and said, Danny, look at you. You're a mess. You have to stop the pills and stop the videos. I was angrier than a nest of disturbed wasps, so I snatched the pills off him and kicked him out of the room. Then I yelled, You don't get it! Just leave me alone! Jake didn't say much to me after that, and I carried on with my mukbang bubble. Soon I hit 100,000 subscribers, and to celebrate, I went live with the table packed full of my favorite foods, fried chicken, pizza, donuts, and so on. I was stuffing my face when I felt so hot and sticky the room began to spin. I slurred out, I, I don't feel so good. Then I fainted in the middle of a live stream. I woke up a few hours later in the hospital with a drip in my arm and a serious-faced doctor glaring down at me. 
They told me that I had high cholesterol, and if I carried on like this, I'd end up with diabetes and stomach bleeding. Well, that was it. I burst into tears and vowed that I would make some big changes. I love eating. That will never change. But I just can't do the mukbang videos anymore. Now, I still enjoy food, but I don't overindulge anymore. Oh, I also have a new job working in a restaurant, and amazingly, I've managed to resist eating all of the tasty-looking food. I'm on the way to becoming the cute, confident version of myself again. And from now on, if I'm happy, sad, or whatever, well, I talk to Jake about it, instead of turning to food. I will always love food. But I guess I eventually figured out that I love my health, and Jake even more. Shh, don't tell him that. It'll give him a big head. Hey, you! Quit standing there and come clean my locker already! You're destined to be a maid, just like your mom! Suddenly, a whole group of kids erupted into laughter, and I just froze. I glanced back, wondering how they knew my secret. But then I realized they were mocking some other girl. Phew, what a relief! This new school seemed intense. And when I walked into the classroom, three of my new classmates wouldn't stop staring at me. But I just ignored them. But at lunch, one of them came over to me and said, I guess your family is super rich, right? I didn't know what to say. So I just replied with, Um, no. No, they're kind of normal. Why? Then he raised his voice. How dare you try to sit here then? This is our table. Move! I immediately got up and ran to an empty seat on the corner table. That's when some kid told me that the three rich kids were Brent, Sophia, and Jasmine. He told me that the best way to stay out of trouble was to avoid them at all costs, because their parents basically funded the whole school, and so everyone had to respect them. But I couldn't avoid them, because the very next day, Sophia came running up to me and said, Why do you keep your family a secret? Come on, spill! I freaked out. Why did she suddenly ask me that? But then Jasmine appeared and said, Girl, that bag you wore yesterday is totally sold out. How did you get your hands on one? Oh, right. They were probably talking about my Insta post from yesterday. And so I said, Oh, my dad bought it for me in Paris. Sophia's eyes went wide and she said, OMG, your dad is so cool. Why are you wearing it today? Shoot, they were going to catch me out. I had to think fast. Um, my parents don't want me to show it off, so they said I can't bring it to school. Sophia and Jasmine burst out laughing and said my family sounded cool but weird. If only they knew the truth. The bag wasn't even mine. It was just from a modeling job I did to make some extra pocket money. In fact, my parents were super poor. My mom worked as a maid, and my dad was a security guard. Obviously, I couldn't afford fancy designer bags, but the rich kids didn't need to know that, right? At lunch, I saw them walking towards my table, and Brent said, What do your parents do? Just tell us. We won't tell anyone. I told them my dad was the CEO of a big fashion company, and my mom worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I wasn't proud of my lie but the alternative was being treated like the girl I saw on my first day at this school, and I didn't want that at all. They all looked amazed, and Jasmine said, That makes sense why you're so pretty and smart. Then Brent jumped in and said, But then why are you a scholarship kid, hmm? I just smiled and kept quiet. I couldn't think of a good lie and didn't want to take this any further. I thought they would leave me alone after that, but they kept approaching me and even started to ask me to join them at the rich kids' table. I couldn't say no, but when they asked me to hang out on weekends, I made up excuses. Not because I didn't want to join, but because there was no way on earth I could afford it. I didn't even dare to ask my parents, as they were working so hard to save up for my college tuition. I was so afraid of my lies catching up with me, so whenever I modeled for high-end stuff, I'd post a pic to my Insta. One time, I shared a photo of me wearing super expensive heels and captioned it, Thanks, Dad. Love you. Sometimes, I even took it to the next level and edited travel photos, so it looked like I'd spend the weekend in Paris. And one time, 
I even photoshopped me driving in a Lamborghini. It was a lot of effort, but it was better than being mocked for being poor, like what happened to me in my last school. I couldn't go through that again. One time, I decided to go shopping with them, and it was crazy to watch them buying everything in sight without even thinking about it. I couldn't even dream of a life like that. But when we got to the bag shop, Jasmine pointed to a fancy-looking bag and said she'd bought it yesterday. Then she asked me, You probably already have it, right? I just grinned and said, Yep, my mom bought it for me last time she was in Milan. But then Jasmine said, Yay! Okay, cool. So let's both wear them on Monday. Everyone will be jealous. That weekend, I felt sick. I had to buy that bag. I decided to raid my piggy bank, but when I got to the shop, I realized I only had one-tenth of the amount needed. I was so shocked. Who would spend that much on a bag? While I was standing there, a woman came in and bought it without hesitation. Why was it so easy for rich people? I decided to follow her just out of curiosity and saw her going to the restroom. I couldn't believe it. She just left her new bag by the sink and then went into the cubicle. I looked around and saw the coast was clear. So I quickly grabbed the bag and walked out of the restroom. I ignored the guilt about stealing it from her and headed home. All I could think about was what would happen if I walked up to school on Monday without the bag. But as soon as I reached my room, the regret was eating away at me. Would I go to jail if they find out? My parents would kill me. Well, Monday morning rolled around and I proudly wore my new bag to school. Brent, Jasmine, and Sophia were so surprised and said I had the limited edition version, which was twice the price as the normal one. This made me feel even more guilty, but from the looks I got all day, it was worth it. Everyone saw me as one of the rich kids now. Soon it would be summer vacation, and Brent said he had a holiday house in Hawaii and suggested we all go for one week together. No way I could afford that. So I lied and said I had to go to Paris with my dad for an event. But then Jasmine said her parents were away, so we could have a party at her house instead that weekend. She suggested we dress up and said she couldn't wait to see my clothes I wore outside of school. Oh no, I was dreading this. Brent said he would pick me up at home and drive me there, but I told him to meet me at school instead as my parents were so strict. Oh my gosh, all of this lying was making me feel exhausted. But no way could I let them see my dilapidated old house, especially as I'd lied and told them we lived in a villa with a pool and golf course. My lying was becoming a big problem. I mean, where would I get a dress from? I lay there worrying about it, and suddenly I heard my parents talking in their room. My mom was saying, She'd finally saved enough to send me to college and asked my dad if he could deposit it in their bank tomorrow, as she had to work at some party. Then she said she'd been keeping it in her closet for safekeeping. I thought about it for a while. I mean, the money was for me anyways, right? So what harm would it do if I just took it now? The next morning, I snuck into their room and took all of the money and rushed out to the mall to buy a gorgeous purple dress and sparkly shoes. This was absolutely the life that I deserved. After that, I took an Uber to school, where Brent, Jasmine, and Sophia picked me up. I had like a million missed calls from my mom and dad, but I ignored it and turned my phone off. I just wanted to enjoy a full day living like a true rich kid. Brent drove us towards Hampton's Country Club, and I couldn't believe it. Jasmine's family owned this place. Wow! When we arrived, a valet came over, but Brent was so rude to him, he shouted at him and said, Listen, buddy, this car cost four million dollars. If you even leave one tiny mark, you'll be paying for it for the rest of your life. I turned around to see the valet's reaction. Then my jaw almost hit the floor. It was my dad. He saw me and looked surprised, but before he could say anything, we walked off. We hung out in the country club for a bit, then in the evening, we drove to Jasmine's house. Her place was insane. She had a tennis court, her own cinema, and don't even get me started on how many cars her family owned. We sat down to eat in the dining room, and I kid you not, there were four maids waiting to serve us. 
We each had our own one. I was too busy being shocked to notice my maid walking towards me. But then I heard a familiar voice. Sweetie, what are you doing here? Mom? I was horrified. The party she'd mentioned yesterday. This was the party. Oh, no. This was a disaster. Jasmine looked surprised and said, Do you know her? So I said, Oh, she used to be a maid at our house. My mom looked crushed and said, A maid? How could you say that? Then Jasmine got annoyed and said, Don't you dare speak to my guest like that. Get out of my sight. My mom ran off, almost in tears. And for the next little while, Brent and Sophia treated her terribly too. Brent even asked her to clean his shoes. My mom was being treated like this all because of me. I could see she was really upset, and she accidentally dropped some sauce on Jasmine's dress. And then Jasmine just lost it. She pushed my mom and screamed, Are you crazy? Do you know how much this dress cost? Well, that was it. I'd had enough. I ran over and helped her up. Mom, are you okay? Mom? Jasmine, Brent, and Sophia all shouted. So I said, Yes, she is my mom, and how dare you treat her like that? Tears were pouring down my cheeks, and I felt so humiliated. Needless to say, they kicked us out, and Jasmine even threw some $10 bills at us and said, Take it. Go back to your broken-down house. You're stinking up our air. I couldn't stop crying. It was exactly how they treated that girl on my first day at school. I didn't have much choice but to tell my parents the truth. That I'd lied to everyone, stolen the bag, and even stolen their money just so I could pretend to be rich. I've never been so ashamed in all my life, especially after everything my parents had done for me. It took some time, but they eventually forgave me, and we moved to a small town out in the countryside so I could start at a new school. I never wanted to see those rich kids again. Now, I'm working hard to finish school and save enough money for college, and I've realized that being rich didn't even make me happy. My family might be poor, but they're the nicest people I've ever met, and you can't buy that in any designer shop. So, who knows the answer to this? The teacher asked. The whole class was silent as they looked down at their desks and scratched their heads. Suddenly a hand was raised. Yes, it was me. Just me. In fact, physics was my forte subject, so the question on the board didn't baffle me, so I gave an in-depth answer. The teacher looked surprised, then she smiled at me and said, It looks like we have a budding Einstein in our midst. All this praise was a little embarrassing. Also, I noticed that all the girls in the class were looking at me with admiring eyes. Meanwhile, I overheard one boy whisper, Where did this robot come from? I unconsciously glanced over at Vivian. She was sitting in the corner of the classroom and even she was gawping over at me. Meeting my gaze, she immediately pouted and looked away. For the rest of the day, I continued to impress my teachers and classmates. In English Lit, I recited a verse from Twelfth Night, and in math... I wrote down the formula for pi on the board. Hey, being smart has its highlights, and it was good to get recognition for my brains. I'd already been recruited into both the physics club and the quiz team. Hey, turned out this new school was not that bad. I'm Easton, and if you haven't seen part one of my story, I advise you to go and check it out. So, I'm only at this elite school because my sister Grace is marrying an older rich man named Owen. Then, there's Vivian. Owen's daughter. I haven't quite worked her out yet, but she seems like trouble. As the first days went, mine was a success, so I was grinning as I walked toward the bus stop. Suddenly, a girl caught up with me and patted me on the shoulder. Hey, I'm Lila. We're in the same class. Hi, Lila. I'm Easton. I smiled at her. You're so good at, well, everything, she giggled. So, um, I like physics too. I think we should study together sometime. She chewed on her lip as she twizzled a strand of her hair around her finger. Yes, sure. Suddenly a nudge distracted me. Vivian. She swaggered past us then looked back at me and pouted. Seeing this, Lila rolled her eyes and tutted out, That girl is such a nuisance. 
I'd recommend you steer clear of the likes of her. I nodded at Lila's words, but kept my eyes on Vivian. At that moment, bump. Vivian, with her head so high, striking her arrogant walk, had crashed straight into some nerd who was walking while looking at his phone. I winced as I watched her fall on top of him, and his phone flung away and smashed as it hit the ground. She blushed and scrambled to get up, frantically took out the money from her wallet, and stuffed it into the boy's hand and hurried away. Huh? What an obnoxious girl, Lila snarked. Thinking daddy's money solves everything? How ignorant! Sigh. I can only give her a shrug hearing those words, then quickly made my excuses about having to catch my bus. That night, I was watching Mythbusters on TV in the living room, when I suddenly saw Grace running out of the bathroom screaming. Her skin had these red patches all over it, and she was crying out how there were dog hairs on her towel. At that moment, Vivian passed us. She looked Grace up and down, then smirked and said, Oh my, my. Our model looks like a lobster today. Grace was so angry that she somehow managed to turn even redder. Vivian, you dare? Just you wait. After that, Grace burst into the office and dragged Owen into the living room. Oh man, it was really serious this time. Owen, look at me. I'm hideous and it's down to that spiteful child. She pointed at a still smirking Vivian. These tricks of hers are unacceptable. She shook her arm vigorously, then stomped her feet on the floor. Owen frowned at Vivian, but she didn't show any guilt. Instead, she just shrugged and said, I have no idea what she's talking about. The atmosphere in the house was so tense that I literally couldn't breathe. Seeing this, Grace continued, Honey, it's time we sent her to boarding school. The teachers there will be better equipped to manage her and help her change. Owen listened attentively, then nodded. Vivian's smirk dropped and she glared at Grace, then turned to Owen and said harshly, Dad, why do you always listen to her? She's just an outsider. I'm your daughter. Okay, let's take it slow. I'll see what's the best for you. Then he turned to Grace and said softly, Come on, darling, let's go get you some medicine. Then he led Grace to their bedroom. I thought that the threat of boarding school would change Vivian, but no. It only seemed to entice her more. One day during dinner, Owen's phone rang. He went out of the room to answer it, and when he returned, his face was all scrunched up in anger. Then he slammed his fist on the table. Vivian, you're causing trouble again? How dare you break in and steal stuff from the chemistry lab? I, I really have no words. She didn't respond. Still focused on her plate, which drove Owen even madder. He shouted, Your teacher said if you make any more minor mistakes, they'll expel you. Is that what you want? Oh my god, expelled from school? That would bring shame to our family, Grace added. Vivian glared at Grace, but she still continued. I did tell you to send her to boarding school, but you refused. Then suddenly, her eyes lit up as if she had just come up with some crazy idea. Then she turned to look at me with a smile that sent chills down my spine. Ah, I know. Easton's a top student, and he's in most of Vivian's classes, isn't he? So he can supervise her. Maybe there will be good results. What? No way! Vivian and I shouted in unison. While I was silently cursing Grace's crazy idea, Owen seemed quite amused by it. Yeah, that sounds good. No way! Who the hell is he to monitor me? Well, if you don't like it, then I suggest you go up to your room and start packing for boarding school. Vivian didn't say anything else. Just sulked and stormed back to her room. Owen shook his head wearily, then told me to go have a little talk with him in his office. Easton, please help me keep an eye on Vivian. Honestly, I don't want to send her away to a boarding school, but I can't sit around and wait for her to be expelled either. This put me in a dilemma here. I didn't want any involvement with this stubborn girl, but I couldn't say no to Owen. Seeing me hesitate, he continued, Please, she's a good kid. She's just had a tough time and she's so angry at everything. She's so angry at me. And yeah, you guess it, I gave in and agreed to help him. Then he immediately listed off a series of tasks. Don't let Vivian get anything lower than a C. Don't let her hang out with any bad friends, including Carter, 
her current unpleasant boyfriend. Follow her closely and don't let her break any school rules. Make sure she takes studying seriously for once. These sounded simple, right? For normal people, maybe, but... Vivian was far from normal. Instead, she was troublesome, cunning, and uncooperative. I had no idea how I was going to convince a rebel like Vivian to abide by any of these rules. But I told Owen I'd help. So now I had to stick to my word. So from then on, I officially became Vivian's tutor and butler. I had to tutor her every day, keep an eye on her 24-7, and of course, put up with her mischievous pranks to escape my management. Please, focus! Why do you keep on staring out the window and daydreaming when the exams are right around the corner? I got really mad at Vivian. I don't want to, but I have a headache, so I just can't concentrate. She wasn't fooling me with that fake pity face. I immediately pulled a tablet of aspirin out of my shirt pocket and tossed my head to signal her to take it so that she could keep studying. Vivian was dumbfounded, picked up her pen, and started doing the homework. But within just less than five minutes, she turned to me and asked, Hey, Easton, do you like playing games? I flipped the pages of the book and reluctantly said yes. Clearly, she was just waiting for that, as she immediately took out her Nintendo Switch, excitedly gave it to me and said, So you can play this, and I'll sleep for a bit. I stayed up so late last night watching movies. Hmm. When the time's up, just tell my dad that we finished studying. Before I can say anything, she'd already jumped onto her bed and wrapped herself in blanket. Ugh, so frustrating. But then an idea popped in my head. Well, then let's change the learning method. Language shower. How does that sound? Then I reached for the mini speaker on the table, played a Spanish audio lesson at the highest volume, and placed it right by her ears. She quickly covered her head with a pillow, but I didn't give up and continued pushing the speaker close. After rolling around in bed for a while, she finally admitted defeat and with a frowning face, went back over to the desk and said, Okay, just stop this crazy torture right away, please. You want me to sit here and study, right? I folded my arms and smiled smugly. Ha! This girl is not that hard to handle. I didn't share Vivian's carefree attitude. Instead, I was so anxious that she would fail her exams, and I'd get the blame. I even had to beg her, Hey, please... Focus on studying literature, please. If you get an F, then I will be dead meat. Huh? That's none of my business, Vivian sneered. I desperately passed her my essay. Here, I've already prepared this for your reference. You just have to memorize it. She quickly scanned it once, then dropped it down on the table and replied, Nah, you can learn it by yourself. I have better things to do. Helplessly, I picked up the essay and read it out loud. I read it again and again, with the hope that while she was polishing her nails, she could remember a few sentences. At first, Vivian seemed annoyed, but then she giggled and said, Okay, let me learn on my own. Your poor face looks so funny. What a miracle! She actually started reading through the notes, but to be honest, I didn't expect much. But you know what? The most unexpected thing happened. When we were standing outside of the school gates, she showed me her exam results. B's and C's, and not one D. Man, this felt even better than when I got an A+. Well, almost. I was about to congratulate her when I heard someone shout her name. Then I turned around to see some kids walking over to her. Oh no. Were these the bad influences Owen told me to keep her away from? Oh my god, Evan! Let's get married on April 3rd! What? Are you serious? Yeah, look! Then she waved her phone in my face. On the screen was some article about choosing special dates to get married. It's 040321. We could get married anyways, right? So why not choose a unique date? And you'll never forget our wedding anniversary. Uh, but babe, that's three days away. Uh, how are we going to arrange a wedding in such a short time? She jumped to her feet. We will marry on this special date. Then she ran off upstairs. She was kidding, right? as this idea was insane. Oh, by the way, that was Mila, my girlfriend. And I'm Evan, and we've been dating for over a year now. I didn't give any more thought to her mad idea, but then later I saw her making all these calls to wedding locations and everything, and that's when I realized she wasn't kidding. 
Unsurprisingly, all the local wedding venues were fully booked for that date. So Mila came up with a crazy plan. We would drive to the wedding capital of the world, Vegas. My God, this was lunacy. But Mila wouldn't take no for an answer, so it was settled. We were going to Vegas, baby. Um, there's one problem. We live in Alaska, so the trip would take us about two days and 16 hours. We called into work to take a few days off, and then we woke up super early and began our long journey to Vegas. I have to admit that I was kind of excited about our adventure. But little did we know how many ridiculous situations we would come across on our way. We started the journey at 5.30, and only a few hours in, Mila got peckish, so she started munching on our snack supply. Later on, I was craving potato chips too, so I asked her to feed me some. But to my horror, none of the snacks were left. And we hadn't even crossed city limits yet. That's not humanly possible. Then, when we reached the highway, she suddenly said she needed a pee. I stopped at the nearest service station, but she didn't go to the restroom. Instead, she turned to me and said, Actually, uh, since we're here now, why don't we go grab some lunch? Excuse me? But it was 10 a.m. And didn't she just eat all our snacks? I knew it was pointless arguing with a hungry girl, so I just followed her. After that, we hit the road again. I was getting a bit bored, so I reached for my phone to turn on some Post Malone, but Mila stopped me and said that she had something far more interesting. The audio novel to all the boys I've ever loved before. Jesus. It was so boring that it almost sent me to sleep. So for the safety of our lives and the lives of other drivers, I decided to stop at a motel to get some sleep. Besides, I couldn't endure hearing any more of Laura Jean and this guy Peter. The next day after breakfast at a diner, we were walking to our car when Mila suddenly saw a pregnant woman loading stuff into her trunk. She immediately ran over to the lady, then told me to do the heavy loading while she just stood there and chatted to her. Suddenly, the lady touched her stomach and said that she wasn't feeling well. Oh, oh my God, don't tell me that she was gonna... Oh boy, her water broke! Quick, we need to get her in your car and take her to the hospital! My car? <laughs> what if the baby comes out? But Mila didn't listen and was already helping the lady get into the back seat. My God. I hope the baby didn't slip out too soon or else I'd have to burn my car. Let me drive. You sit in the back with her. Her husband isn't here, so she needs a man for emotional support. What? That sounded absurd, but there was no time to argue. The lady began to scream because of the pain. I tried to calm her down by telling her to breathe in and out, but she just shouted, Shut up! Then held my hand and squeezed it really hard. Oh my God, she was going to break my fingers like toothpicks. It hurt so much I began to scream with her. Thank God we got the lady to the hospital on time. Phew, I couldn't imagine what would happen to my hand and my car if the baby had arrived any sooner. So the journey continued. As we were driving through Fort Nelson, I saw a guy holding a sign asking for a ride to the nearest service station. Of course, I ignored the dude and wanted to drive past him, but my girl Mila over here just couldn't seem to brush that aside. She made me stop the car and warmly welcomed him into our car. Ugh, that was so annoying. While I was driving, I smelled something really awful. My God, it was so smelly that I couldn't breathe. It had to be this dude. I gave Mila an angry glare, but she just gave me a guilty smile back. Well, at least she had to suffer too. I had no choice but to open the windows on a highway. Mila clutched her head as she shouted, Are you crazy? Close the windows! The wind is ruining my hair! Oh my God, was her hair more important than her nose? Thank God, after 30 minutes, we reached a service station and the guy got out of my car. I went to the restroom to freshen myself up, and when I came back, Mila was nowhere to be found. I was about to call her, but oh man, I left my phone in the car and she had the keys. After 45 minutes of searching, I gave up and went back to the car to find her sitting there, her arms folded as she glared at me. Um, where have you been? You do realize we have a tight schedule to keep. What? Was she serious? Then I suddenly heard someone coughing in the back. I turned around and to my horror saw a little boy sitting there. What the... Why was there a kid in my car? Mila explained that his school bus had left without him and we needed to take him to his camping location. Not again, Mila. Why does she have to be that sweet little angel who couldn't help but have to help everybody? But my God, now there was not the time to be Charlie's angels and rescue that little kid. I told her, but she immediately accused me of being heartless, cruel, and everything. Jesus. That's the third person I'd given a free ride to today. As I was driving to the camping location, the kid suddenly felt nauseous. I shouted at him to hold it as we were on the highway, and it was impossible to stop. But he started to make vomit sounds. 
Mila freaked out, so she grabbed something and let the kid throw up in there. After I found a place to stop, I turned around and saw that Mila threw all my stuff out and used my precious Nike duffel bag as a vomit bag. That's it. I'd had enough. So I shouted at the kid, Get out of my car! He got so scared that he ran out and started crying really loudly. That wasn't cool. He's just a scared little kid. How would you like it if your school bus left you behind? Okay, maybe I was a bit harsh on the kid. You can't blame me. It had been a long couple of days, and that was my favorite bag, but, but still, I went outside to comfort the kid. Hey, please don't cry. I'm really sorry for earlier. I, I didn't mean to shout at you. I'm just really tired from all that driving. The kid stopped crying, but still looked very scared of me. So I said, hey, if you give me a smile, I promise to buy you some candy later. He immediately smiled and hugged me. Oh, great. I was sure Mila didn't wipe his mouth clean after all that throwing up, as I got some vomit stains on my shirt. But hey, the hug kind of felt nice. We dropped the kid off and his teachers were very grateful. But because of everything we'd been through today, there was no way we could rest in a motel and make it on time to Vegas. So the only option was to drive through the night, so Mila took the wheel so I could catch some Zs. A honking sound startled me and I sat up and saw that we were going at a snail's pace. Mila, what's wrong? You're driving slower than my granny! I think we're lost. What? Why didn't she wake me up? Then, oh no, we suddenly heard a cop siren. And guess why we were pulled over? Yup, for driving too slowly in a 60 mile an hour zone. My god, I was freaking out. But Mila turned to me and said, Just keep quiet and I'll do the talking. She opened the window and began to speak in a weird way. Hi officer, did I do something wrong? Can I see your license please? Oh yeah, absolutely, here you go officer, good looking. It's Goodlin. Oh sorry, my mistake. Please don't look in my picture. I was having a bad hair day when I took it. Oh, dear God, was she actually flirting with the cop? He looked at her license with a frown on his face. Oh, no, we'd end up being locked up. Well, Miss Forrester, I think you look great in this picture. I'll let you off with a warning this time, but please be more careful. Driving at 20 in a 60-mile-an-hour zone is more dangerous than it sounds. Oh, oh, my God, thank you so much. Today must be my lucky day. I'm stopped by not only a very handsome, but also kind-hearted officer. If I don't get married tomorrow, I will definitely get your number. My God, I think he gets it. After that, I didn't talk to her the whole night. How could she flirt with another man right in front of me? And now we had less than 16 hours to get to Vegas and get married. So we grabbed a quick breakfast from a diner, then carried on driving. On the plus side, we finally crossed the Canadian border. We were in Montana, baby. Then Mila turned to me and grumbled out, FYI, you forgot to close the window again. Anything could have crawled inside while we were at that diner. Ugh, was she serious? I didn't have the time nor the patience for this, so I just nodded to let it go. We sat in silence, but suddenly I heard squeaking. No way was that Mila. Oh my god, something must be in my car. I pulled over and looked in the back seat to see a skunk jumped out right at me. We both screamed and got out of the car. While I was trying to think of a way to get rid of it, Mila suddenly pointed. Um, do you realize the car is rolling down that hill? I turned around and the car was really moving. I must have forgotten to pull the handbrake. We chased after it, but luckily it rolled into a muddy patch. I looked inside and phew, at least the skunk had gone. I tried driving away, but the car made an awful sound and only seemed to sink lower into the mud. So I went outside to push the car and Mila switched to the driver's seat, but then mud splashed everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere. I called out for her to stop, but guess what? She didn't hear me over the music she just had to play. Unbelievable. While well, here I was, covered in dirt. But, well, as annoying as the loud music was, the weekend's blinding lights kind of boosted me up somehow, which made me push the car as hard as I could. And yes, it got out of the mud. I was tired, dirty, hungry, and I just wanted to get to Vegas in one piece. Was that too much to ask? I think God heard my prayers, because we made it to Las Vegas, baby. And it was 11.30 p.m. I had about 10 minutes to shower and change, but Mila insisted that we go straight into the chapel. My God, Mila. I looked like I'd been wrestling John Cena in a mud bath. We ran towards the reception, and when I looked at my watch, it was 11.45 p.m. Oh my God, I couldn't believe we made it. The past three days felt like three freaking months. Hi, it's uh, 040321, and we're here to get married. The reception frowned at us, then said, Sorry, sweetie, but it's the 4th. Then she pointed at the calendar on her desk. Huh? 
Had we jumped time or something? Then I had a light bulb moment. Nevada is one hour ahead of Alaska. My God, we totally forgot about that. It was already April 4th. Mila looked devastated, and I was feeling a bit down about it too. But if I really had been a groom with this muddy look, I never would have dared look at the wedding pictures ever. Moreover, after everything we'd been through on this trip, I think it's best we get to know each other a bit more before we get married. I'm already happy with what we're having right now, so no need to rush, right? Nina, why are you just my cousin and not my mommy? Claudia peered up at me with curious eyes. I knew where this had come from, as the topic of the week at kindergarten was family. Claudia's innocent words made me squirm with guilt. Was I a bad person? I'd been asking myself this daily for the last four years. Yep, the little girl next to me wasn't my daughter. I stole her from her real dad and have been raising her single-handedly ever since. It all started with my Uncle Oliver, who is a successful businessman and a super loving person. I owe a lot to him and to my grandma, as they're the ones who raised me after my parents died in a car crash when I was just a little girl. My uncle had been doing a great job filling up the missing father figure in my life. But he also wanted a biological child of his own, which was quite a tricky problem to an asexual man like him. One evening, I just got in from hanging out with my friends when I saw him sitting at the kitchen table. His head in his hands, I asked, Uncle, what's up? He looked at me with swollen red eyes, sighed, then said, Nina, it's silly, really. It's just my birthday is next month, and I don't have the one thing I want the most in the world. I pulled him into a hug and comforted him. I knew he's still longing for a kid, and I wanted to help him. So, together, we looked into the surrogacy process. My uncle was so excited, and he did all the paperwork to buy a donor egg. Now, all he needed was a surrogate mother. So he went through his local surrogacy agency, and they presented him with five potential surrogate profiles. I swear, he must have reread each of them about 100 times. But he eventually chose one. A woman called Kathy. On paper, Kathy sounded perfect. She was a 31-year-old who already had a healthy little boy called Robbie. A contract was drawn up. All Kathy's medical care would be paid for, and she'd also receive a pretty large sum of money. Then, when the baby was one week old, my uncle would raise them alone. This all sounds perfect, huh? Well, it soon took a turn for the worst. Once Kathy fell pregnant... Uncle Oliver wanted to be around her more so he could bond with the baby. One time I walked into the lounge to classical music playing, and my uncle pressing his head to Kathy's belly to see if the baby could hear the music. Soon coming home to find Kathy there became the norm for me. At first I didn't mind as she was always really sweet to me, and we even had small talks from time to time. But then, one morning when I was heading downstairs to go to work, I spotted her standing in the yard helping my grandma water the flowers. I was about to walk over to greet them. Then I heard her say, Oliver is such a lovely man, but he's so busy. I worry he'll find it all a bit too much juggling a newborn and work. Then grandma said, Don't worry, sweetie, as he'll have Nina and me around to help. But Nina is so young, and she has her own life to lead. She's always out at a party or with some boy, and you can't be expected to take care for a baby, not at your age. I just don't want a stranger caring for my baby, not when I could help out. What? Her sweet as sugar behavior was all an act, wasn't it? How dare she try and manipulate my lovely grandma? A few days later, I went down to dinner to see Kathy sitting there. She smiled at me and asked me about my day. I wasn't buying her overly nice act, but I went along with it anyway. At one point, she suddenly took her phone out, then her smile turned into a frown. Oh, no. Robbie has a fever. I better go to him. She immediately pulled back her chair and stood up. You know how it is. Only a mother's love can make a little one feel better. Then she left. Kathy's poisonous words had definitely got to Grandma. As she showed concern for Robbie and let out a gentle smile as her eyes followed Kathy's steps. And that was only the beginning. 
Kathy's game playing continued as a few days later, she showed up on our doorstep in tears. Then she came out with some story about how the venue for Robbie's birthday party had canceled and they refused to refund her. Like clockwork, my uncle told her she could have the party at ours and that he'd cover the costs. On the day of the party, I saw Kathy pass my uncle all of the receipts for the bouncy castle, magician, catering, etc. She gently pat her tummy and grinned. You'll be such a wonderful father. You know, we could always have another one after this. For free, of course. Then, later on, I saw her whispering something to Robbie. Then the next minute, he ran over to my uncle. He hugged his legs and said, Thank you for the party, Daddy. Then Kathy hurried over to him, ruffled his hair, and said, Oh, honey, he's not your daddy. But it'd be nice, wouldn't it, to all live here together with the baby? Enough was enough. So that night, I confronted my uncle and grandma about it. I don't have a good feeling about Kathy. I think she's trying to break the contract. My uncle sighed, then said, I know. Then grandma added, Kathy's right, though. Oliver can't do this alone. You're too young and I'm too old. So it makes sense for Kathy to stick around and help. Still better than having some random stranger around, right? I can help out, I raised my voice. Rather me than her. I don't trust her. Grandma shook her head. But she's the mother. She's carrying the baby. Their bond is undeniable. I know what it's like to lose people I love. Kathy will break this baby's heart. I'm sure of it. She's only out for herself. My face turned red as I raised my voice. My uncle remained silent. Then he just sighed and walked out of the room. I ran after him and pulled him back. Uncle, you made your choice right from the beginning. Why change it now? He replied with his eyes glued to the ground. Your grandma has a point. What? My voice was up to high pitch. Stop letting that witch Kathy manipulate you. He shook his head, then walked away. Oh my God. They were being controlled like puppets. This needed to stop. So I decided to confront Kathy about it. My chance arrived the next day. She was helping to cook dinner, so I said to her, I know what you're up to. You just want an easy life without any money worries. That's why you're manipulating them. But you can't fool me. She stopped chopping the carrots, then looked at me. Is that so? The thing is, Nina, I always get what I want. She gave me an evil smirk. Then she slammed the knife into the carrot with such ferocity that I flinched. It was official. Kathy was crazy, but I didn't have any proof. So basically, there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. As expected, the craziness continued into the next day. I went to Grandma's room and saw her looking flustered as she searched through her bedside drawer. I, again, couldn't find my pills. And that they kept on showing up in strange places. She seemed really worried that she was losing her mind. Later on, when we were all eating dinner, Kathy went to the fridge. And surprise, surprise, guess what she found there? Yep, Grandma's pills. Obviously, Kathy had put them there. Then she walked over to Grandma, rubbed her shoulder, concernedly said, I should have taken care of you more. We should have you checked by the doctor as soon as possible. Age can be so cruel on the mind, and you don't want to be forgettable around the baby. After that... Grandma seemed totally convinced that she was too old to take care for a baby, even after the doctor told her she was fine. Furthermore, she was adamant that Kathy should move in to help out. Ugh! What a snake Kathy was! A month later, the baby was born. A girl. My uncle named her Claudia, after my mom. We all cried happy tears and welcomed her into our family. Kathy got her wish, and both her and Robbie moved into our house. One morning, I came downstairs to see Kathy holding the baby. In front of her was the ripped-up contract. I told her to leave, and she smirked and said, You're a smart girl, Nina, but you're no match for me. I'm not going anywhere. This is my home now, so get used to it. I knew there was no point telling my uncle and grandma about this. I couldn't let this woman destroy my family. She was dangerous. She could end up hurting everyone. She'd never stop until she got what she wanted, and there's no way I could let that happen. 
So, when Kathy was in the bathroom, I picked Claudia up, and before I could stop myself, I was fleeing from the house and out of their lives. I moved to a new town and got a new job. It was only meant to be temporary, but I guess I was too selfish and afraid to go back. I'd always been truthful with Claudia about one thing, that I was her cousin, not her mom. So, when Claudia said the words, Nina, why are you just my cousin and not my mommy? I felt so guilty. She was missing out on a relationship with her father because of me. Yes, I'd wanted my family to get out of Kathy's trap, but what I did wasn't fair to my uncle. I knew that now. I had no right taking his daughter away from him for four years. I felt so awful. Thinking about the distress, I must have caused him and Grandma. The guilt was eating me up, and I knew I couldn't carry on like this anymore. So I called up an old family friend and asked him to approach my uncle. Later that day, my friend got back to me with a message from him. Kathy's gone, and she won't be coming back. You were right about her, of course. She was only after my money. After you left, she didn't seem to care about Claudia at all, and she threatened to go to the cops and report you unless I paid her off. Please, just come back to me and Grandma. We sure aren't happy with what you did, but we know you had good intentions. We love you, and we just want our girls back home. Tears streamed down my face. They'd found it in their hearts to forgive me. Running away had never been the answer, even if I'd done it with good intentions. It was time to stop running. It was time to go home. So I peered down at the little girl who reminded me so much of my uncle. Claudia? I took her hand. Are you ready to go home to Daddy? I'm so excited, as it's my graduation ceremony tomorrow. Eek! And today, I'm on my way to the airport to pick my mom up. I can't wait to see her, but, well, ugh, it's complicated. I grew up in Philly, but I've been studying here in Toronto for the last three years. I'm so grateful to God for letting me be a girl, because, you know, girls' lives are way more colorful than boys' lives are. Clothes, makeup, shoes, you name it. For girls, it's just so much more fun. I understand I'm probably confusing you. Well, up until the age of 18, I lived life as a boy. Kai. Actually, Kai's my legal name. I grew up with toy trucks, dinosaur wallpaper, and a rocket-shaped playhouse. Then, at two years old, Mom moved into a villa out in the countryside. It was just us and our old maid, Rita. Meanwhile, my father and grandparents stayed in the city and ran the family company together. Back then, all I knew was my family was rich and successful, but I didn't think much about it. Hey, I was just a kid. All I cared about was getting to choose what color tumbler I had my juice in. Mom always said we moved away because of her migraines, which worsened in hectic surroundings. Nonsense. She just wanted to keep me away from the family so they wouldn't figure out I was actually a girl. Crazy, huh? So I must have known I was a girl, right? The thing is, when you're little, you pretty much believe